welcome to Caritas Consciousness Project. I'm Gloria Cuellu, and Caritas is dedicated to promoting the evolution of consciousness as the key to individual growth and global healing. We do this through online presentations, interviews with guest speakers, like this evening, as well as classes and study groups. We draw from a wide assortment of both ancient wisdom and leading edge studies in science, consciousness, spirituality, and philosophy, and in this case, metaphysics. Uh, and we've been doing this since 2003. However, in 2020, we began recording our presentations on Zoom. Uh, our video recordings are viewable through our website. We have about 90, I think, recordings. Um, our website is caritascenter.org. And also you can see them on our YouTube channel, which is Caritas Consciousness Project. As a nonprofit organization, we rely on the support of our members and our donors to keep our program going. If you enjoy our presentations and would like to support this program, uh, please make a donation on any page on our website or become a member and enjoy the benefits of membership. So let me now introduce tonight's guest speaker. Dimitri Moraitis is co-founder co and co-spiritual director of the renowned Spiritual Arts Institute. He's an illumined metaphysical teacher, mystic healer, and co-creator slash teacher of the SAI Spiritual Arts Institute programs, and the course curriculums and numerous workshops. Dimitri has been instrumental in bringing Spiritual Arts Institute to the place it is today as a premier metaphysical school. With Barbara Y. Martin, he is co-author of the international bestseller, Change Your Aura, Change Your Life, Communicate, Communing with the Divine, Karma and Reincarnation, the Healing Power of Your Aura, and their newest highly acclaimed book, Heaven and Your Spiritual Evolution, which I finished today. And it was very, very interesting, very well, very clear and concise and interesting. Um, and there, he's an eloquent speaker on a wide variety of metaphysical topics has lectured across the country and appeared on numerous podcasts and radio shows. Welcome, Dimitri, and thank you for making time to be with us this evening. All right. Well, thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here and everyone here joining tonight. Thank you for, for joining us. Um, boy, we, it's going to be an interesting couple of hours. Um, I think the way we're going to do this tonight is I'm going to do a little PowerPoint at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And of course, she mentioned open it up to you for questions. We definitely want this to be interactive and fun and engaging. Um, it's a big topic. You know, now the book is called uh, Heaven and Your Spiritual Evolution. Tonight's talk is called You Don't Go to Heaven, You Grow to Heaven. And interestingly enough, that was that's the first chapter in the book. It also was for a while the, ch the, the title of the book. <laughs> we switched it there. So it is the story of evolution. Interesting, your organization is about the evolution of consciousness, and that's exactly what we do, that basically we're saying our evolution, our spiritual evolution, is a journey in consciousness. We're trying to become more aware, more awake, more alert. We use the terms like enlightenment and things like that to describe a greater heightened state of awareness. Mm -hmm. And as I'm going to show a little bit tonight, especially to the ancient mystics, heaven was a code word for enlightenment. Because to get to heaven, to be in that, you had to be enlightened. So when the Hebrew mystics and others that we'll be talking about tonight were using that word, the public understood it one way, but the, the metaphysicians understood it a different way. And, you know, we do think of heaven as a place to go to if we've been good. <laughs> if we haven't been good, we may go to that other place. It's it's kind of a simple picture. 
because the idea is this is a process. It's not something that happens automatically and it's an evolutionary process. So that's what we're gonna look at tonight. Now, a lot of this material I'm gonna share with you is based on uh, Barbara Martin. The, she and I wrote the book together and a lot of the stories in the book are based on her own clairvoyant experiences. So I'm gonna spend a couple minutes talking about her and then myself, then we'll jump in. Um, Barbara was basically born clairvoyant. At age three, she was starting to see not just little flashes of color, but auras. Um, this was during the Depression era. So she said there were no books. No one understood what I was going through. And if I started talking about it, people thought something was wrong with me. But to her, it just seemed completely natural. Uh, this went on for years until she met a, uh, a person. Interesting enough, her day job was, was leading a theater stock company, which, she, which Barbara joined. <clears throat> And but secretly, she was this hermetic scientist. And one day she called Barbara in privately and basically told her, you can see the aura, can't you? And Barbara's jaw dropped because she said, oh, is that what it's called? She didn't even have a name for it. And the woman said, I can see the aura, too. And I'm a hermetic scientist. My mother or grandmother are all hermetic scientists. And we would like to teach you about your art, your, your talent. And so she had these handwritten books. Unfortunately, you, you cannot get them at, at Amazon um, that really taught a lot of the metaphysical principles. And one of the things she learned, for example, was aura interpretation. So if there was a blue around your head or a purple around your heart area, what did that all mean? And this kind of uncoded a lot of that to understand the placement of the energies means something in the auric field and the uh, color and shading of color. In other words, a bright green, what we call an emerald green, means a balanced and harmonious person. But if it moves to this dirty, dark avocado green, it means a jealous person, the, the sort of a very different interpretation. So it wasn't like you're a green and I'm a blue. The aura is a vast, intricate manifestation, just like we are. And the reason it's important in tonight's discussion is it fuels our evolution. You need power to do everything. And the power you build that is the spiritual energy of your aura. So as Barbara would say, your passport to eternity is the light you earn. We're not going to take our fame, our fortune to the other side when it's time to cross over, but we are going to take our light. So that's the most precious thing you possess. So we are encouraging you, of course, to do everything to keep building up more light. Um, I began my career in the movie business, and I was actually moving in a very nice direction there. Uh, but I didn't grow up clairvoyant, but I was having these experiences, which I just sort of called my inspiration moments. But they got so strong, it led to this rather dramatic awakening, <clears throat> which I call my Saul in the Road to Damascus moment, because it, it fundamentally changed my life. Um, and Literally a year after that, I met Barbara at a dinner party. And that night, I recognized she was the, my teacher. And interestingly enough, one of the things that I had a lot of questions at that time, I still do, <laughs> um, was about the heaven worlds. And when she started talking about it, I realized, oh, my God, she's not talking about it from reading about it. Or she's talking about it from her own experiences. And then I realized, okay, th this is the teacher for me. I started as her student, uh, but right away we knew we, we liked to write. We ended up becoming writing partners. And at the time, all her teachings were inspirational. And after a while, after having like encyclopedia of notes, I said, it's time to write, you know, it's time to organize this. It's time to develop it more. And we started our nonprofit, Spiritual Arts Institute, which is very much alive and thriving today where we've organized these teachings, why we call her 50 years of clairvoyant study, because what you're gonna to get tonight is based on a, a lifetime of study and, and experience. So why don't we kind of dive in a little bit? Now, again, we're, we're hi, why are we tying in heaven and evolution? So one of the questions we're gonna look at now tonight is what is spiritual evolution? What does it actually mean 
to grow your soul. Now, we know what it means to um, grow from a child to an adult. But how does that happen spiritually? How do we actually grow? And how do you begin to measure that? Now, one of the things we know when we're maturing is we feel better about ourselves. We feel more in control of our life. We feel more creative, more abundant. One of the things, you know, sometimes people say about heaven is, well, if I'm just going to sit on clouds playing harps all day long, that sounds a little boring to me. Uh, that's the furthest thing from heaven. Heaven is a place of extraordinary activities and creative expression. The way I like to think of it is think of your most inspired day you've ever had in your life and what it felt like and what you were doing that day and multiply it by about a hundred, and that gives you the idea of what it's like to be in the heaven worlds. You're going to be more expressive there, more intelligent, more wisdom, there's going to be more of everything, and you're going to be in an environment that's totally supporting that. An experience I had some time ago of, of, of being on the other side, it was, again, when I started with Barbara, a lot of things started happening, and that was one of them. Um, again, I, I, it, it, was a, it wasn't a complicated setting. It was very pastoral, very beautiful, rolling hills, kind of a, a, with buildings in the distance. But what was so stunning was the atmosphere. The presence of God was everywhere. I was literally in the atmosphere. It was in the trees. It was, you did not the question whether God existed was not even a question. It was just like saying, <laughs> I, I'm seeing life around me. Okay. And when I came back from that visit, I remember I was on a high for three days. Three, it was just, I never had an experience like that before. Um, but then I also realized they weren't just giving me a nice experience. I wasn't just getting a nice, it, there was a lesson there that that vibration that you felt you have to establish it here in physical life in other words if we are aiming to evolve to the heaven worlds we have to build the heavenly vibration in us here on earth not on the other side and that's going to be one of the big themes we're going to talk about here the other side isn't one place it's many places and they're organized according to levels of evolution, development, power. And all of us here on Earth, this very minute, as we're sitting here together, you've got this beautiful aura, and it's vibrating at a certain rate this moment according to the power you have built. And that rate corresponds to a level on the other side. So if today I was meant to cross over, it's my time to go home. I would take the light I have with me today, and that would determine where I end up on the other side. It's not punishment or reward. It is like attracting like. And if I've earned this place, that's where I'm going. Mm -hmm. But if I have spent a lifetime in squandering my talents and my gifts and doing counterproductive things, I'm not gaining light, I'm losing it. So I'm not going to find myself in this, you know, heightened place on the other side. It's not punishment. I just haven't earned it yet. But as we shall see, too, uh, we'll be sharing that there's always a second chance. Our souls are inherently good. So even when we make terrible mistakes, which we're all going to do from time to time, there's always the opportunity to correct it. Eventually, we all do get it. Some a little bit faster than others, but we're all mystics in the making. It's not if we're ever going to make it to heaven. It's a matter of when we're going to make it to heaven. So on that note, I think I will share the PowerPoint right now. Um, am I, uh, Gloria, is, I just started doing it, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, oh, share. Okay. There we go. Okay, here we go. Um, all right, so I just want to share again, this is a, a picture from Barbara a little while. Unfortunately, she's not on the public platform anymore. 
but we're still very much working together. We're working on our next book together, which which is on consciousness. <laughs> um, <laughs> but they they used to call her the Mozart of metaphysics because. She has so many multiple talents and just alone with the aura, I've never met anyone that could see the aura anywhere near to the depth that she has seen it. And she's been training me in a lot of things and I can tell you it's not an easy chore. Um, it's one thing even to have the talent. It's another thing to have it developed. There's natural clairvoyance, but then developed clairvoyance, it took her decades to really hone those skills down. Um, all right, so from our point of view, and uh, as I, the, the things we're sharing today, yes, are, are from direct experience, but they're also part of a tradition, and the tradition we work from is called the Kingdom of Light Teachings. So everything I'm going to be sharing with you is from those teachings as well as based on a, a more direct experience. So from our point of view, spiritual growth is the gradual process of evolving through the many inner dimensions of life. So we don't just grow when we go over to the other side. We're growing here. We're not only meant to leave this earth better than the way we found it. We're meant to leave this earth at a higher level of consciousness than when we started. And that's the process of evolution. So each of these dimensions has experiences associated with them. So we talk about things like enlightenment. Well, that doesn't just happen. You have to be at a certain level plane of consciousness to even be considered in that realm of being enlightened. So again, we have it's like grades in school. We are going through each of these stages. So right now we're vibrating at one of these spiritual planes. And actually that's telling us right now where we are in our evolutionary process. And it gives clues to the lessons we're meant to be learning right now. The opportunities are being given to us, what lies ahead. <clears throat> and we're not all at the same place on this earth. And it's not a race with each other. Oh, let's see where you are and where I am and who can get there faster. We're on our own ladder of life. We're not comparing ourselves to others. You can have a, like a Mahatma Gandhi of a high evolutionary status in the room with an Adolf Hitler. Physically, they could be there even though they're vibrations are vastly different but again you wouldn't find that so much on the other side so here it is a bit of a melting pot but again it doesn't really matter where others are in their evolutionary place it matters where you are and it matters are you doing everything you can to to grow your soul <clears throat> now three qualities of heaven and i kind of started the show about this a little bit Heaven, you know, who wrote that book, Heaven is for Real? Heaven is not imaginary. The other side is not fantasy land or dreamland or some primordial energy that has no definition. They call the other side the real world, and they call this side the dream world, right? So this is a very real place that we are all going to be part of one day. But it's not just a place. It's a state of consciousness that we have to evolve through here in physical life. So when your aura in this physical world is vibrating at that heavenly rate, then yes, you are going to join the heaven worlds. And <clears throat> the third is the process it takes to get there. It's a journey. There are many, you know, we talk about the hero's journey, Joseph Campbell, talked about all the, the hero's journey and the hero's journey is always difficult even up to the very end the hero doesn't know if they're even going to make it right you look at the the big epic stories about that in movies and literature and again it's a suspenseful all the way to the very end and that's our life journey we're we're struggling we're climbing that mountain ourselves and sometimes it feels like we're going to slip off but somehow we're able to keep going Now, three very broad keys I'll share right now in terms of growing to heaven is, and this was interesting in writing the book, because when we were writing, for example, the aura book, well, everything was focused on the aura. Or if you're writing on karma and reincarnation, everything is focused on karma and reincarnation. <clears throat> but in evolution, it's not just one thing. Several 
dynamics of metaphysics have to come into place to even understand how the evolutionary process works. So there's several things, and one of them I've already, I've already mentioned, the aura and divine light are the fuel of our spiritual ascent. The most important thing we can do is to earn spiritual energy. And you're doing that with every good word, thought, act, and deed that you are doing right now. Every creative, positive, life-enhancing thing, even if you're not getting a gold star for your efforts, is adding to your auric field. Every time you go through a difficult challenge in your life, but you glean the wisdom from that experience, you are growing your soul. And of course, if you are deciding to consciously put your hand to the yoke of light and really pursue it in a more focused way, that's what we would call even the accelerated path. And that's where you can grow your, your, your light even more dramatically. But you cannot get to the heaven worlds without a lot of spiritual power. And second, time. Well, you could say, all right, I grow to heaven, but what if I don't grow to heaven in this life? Am I, am I SOL? No, because it's not a journey of one lifetime. So we cannot really understand the journey to heaven without also understanding the principle of reincarnation. Uh, there's a beautiful quote by Henry Ford, you know, the automaker, that he, when he adopted the theory of reincarnation, he said, when you write this interview down, write it in a way to put people's minds at ease. Because when I adopted this, it made me realize I have time to create. I don't have to get it all done in a single lifetime. And if I muff it up, it's, it's done. I'm finished. So for him, it let the pressure off a little bit, but also motivated him to even do more. So if we do think of our lifetimes as like grades in school, we have to go through many grades, many lifetimes, because there is just too many experiences we need to go through to mature the soul. So it is a journey of many lifetimes. And we've had many lifetimes on this earth. We'll have more ahead of us. So as long as we're doing our part in this incarnation, we're on the journey, the road we need to be. The third one is we're not walking the path alone. We are not islands unto ourselves. There's a beautiful quote in the Talmud that says, for every blade of grass, there's an angel bending over saying grow meaning everything on this earth is supported by the divine we do have to do our own growing but we're not doing this alone so the more we understand there's a cooperative process involved we're meant to be working with each other productively we're meant to be working with the divine productively that's what makes it happen and it doesn't matter you could be on a deserted island a thousand miles away from any physical person, and you're still connected to the divine. So the more you let the divine inspire you, the more you let the divine in your life, the more, think of them like that. earth is the schoolhouse, we are the students. <clears throat> These divine ones are the teachers, and they're teaching us the way home. <clears throat> Now, I wanted to show this a little bit um, because, you know, heaven is interesting because some a lot of people think, well, heaven really started with, you know, the Christian faith, and it was long before that. Sumerians talked about seven heavens, and even you would think Bo the Buddhism doesn't talk about, yes, it does. It doesn't emphasize it as much, but they've got a very complex cosmology. And so does the, the Hindus. So heaven is part of every culture. It's expressed in a different way sometimes, but the basic principles are there. Now, the reason I wanted to show this is this is the, this particular one is the, the Ptolemy example of when, when humanity thought the earth was the center of the universe and everything sort of revolved around it. This was before we, could, we had telescopes that could see beyond what the eye could see. 
So we could only see really as far as Saturn. There was sort of this blob of light that really was Uranus, but basically this model was built around that. And it, it interestingly enough, what Ptolemy created in terms of understanding the motion of the stars uh, of the planets was relatively accurate, even though, I mean, it was relatively accurate in its predictive ability, even though the model itself was, was not correct. The reason I bring this up, though, is what do you have here? You have at the center Earth, and in the outermost level, you have this Empyrean, the highest level, where they thought God and the angels dwelled. And then the celestial objects, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, were the seven heavens. There's your, there's your seven heavens. Now, if we look at this in a... Um, modernistic light, we can say, well, this was naive. They just didn't understand how it all worked. But there is more going on here, which is why I wanted to bring this up. Yes, this is, this is not the accurate picture. But, you know, mystics in the ancient days were well aware of what the real picture was. They may not have been describing it in the way that science can describe it today. But, for example, it is said that Pythagoras acknowledged the you know, geocentric model of the universe in public, but in private, he taught the heliocentric model. But this also brought up another thing of why study the seven heavens together. If this is something that's going to be so far away from us when we achieve these things, why do I need to learn about these things now? It's because of what I said at the beginning of the lecture or talk. Heaven to the mystics was a code word for enlightenment. And this model was used by the mystics, not in its literal sense, but as a symbolism of the stages humanity goes from its earth-centered consciousness, materialism, to being a fully enlightened being in the God awareness. And these seven stages plus the the ones beyond it, were the journey every soul took here on earth to reach their enlightenment. So there was much more going on to this behind the scenes. And I wanted to share that because, especially, you know, we had this planetary alignment recently, where a lot of these planets were in, in a certain alignment. I'm sure if it had been the ancient world, there would have been major celebrations going on for that, you know. <laughs> It would have been a, a world event at that point if, if, if we had been living at the time of Ptolemy. Now, another one I want to show, which is fascinating, is related to the Bible. Now, we all know the beginning of the Bible. And God said, let there be light. I'm going to quote a little bit from the second day, right? And God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, the separate waters from the waters. What does that mean? Right? We may have read this many times saying that that sounds a little bit cryptic to me. Well, this was what I'm showing on the right here was the basic understanding the cosmology of the of the universe when this was written and what the public understood because that was a religious document meant to be read for the public. So let there be an expanse. That's the firmament. So the ancients believed above the firmament, above the sky, there were other waters. And then above that was the heaven of heavens where God dwelt. So there are the waters below that they're speaking of here. So the this second day is saying there was this abyss of water God separated these waters, creating this firmament. The waters above would be connected to heaven. The waters below would be connected to earth. And then the third day, the ones on earth, they said, let the waters be gathered in one place. So there's where the land came up. So in a sense, part of what chapter 1 of, of the Hebrew Bible is describing the ancient understanding 
of the cosmos during their day. But now if any of you have studied Kabbalah or any of the Jewish mystical traditions, you understand that this first chapter has many mystical interpretations. One of the things science points to say, you see, religion doesn't really understand the way the world works, is they say, oh, the world was created in seven days. And it's thought to meant seven literal 24-hour days. But the mystic would not say that at all. Again, here's another coded presentation of how, on one level, to, to appeal to people of the time, it had to present in one way, but behind the scenes, there was a very different interpretation of those seven days, mystically, again, to help students in their journey to enlightenment, because that's what mysticism is about, helping you reach your enlightenment. Now, in the Kingdom of Light teachings, the cosmology works a little differently, and I'm going to give just a very broad outline right now. There's a lot in the book, and it's, a, it's not a simple thing. As I said, the other side is many places. I did use uh, Blake's uh, depiction. He was a very interesting poet, but also um, artist of Jacob's Ladder. That image of the gentleman at the beginning is those of you know the biblical story. Jacob, the patriarch, had a dream. In this dream, he saw this ladder or staircase that went all the way up to heaven, and attending it up and down were these angelic beings. And the mystical interpretation of that is this is the journey from earth. There's that, again, that journey from earth to heaven, but every step of the way is supported by the divine. Just like every key moment in your life right now is being supported by the divine. We have to be allowed to make our own mistakes, but God and the divine are guiding us all along the way. So in our work, of course, we all know the physical world. But there are these other realms. There are the astral worlds, which is literally the hereafter right from here. There are dimensions within those astral worlds. Uh, Sri Uteswar, the teacher of Yogananda, uh, I don't know if you've read Autobiography of a Yogi, uh, when his guru died, he, he was in great grief, and his he came back, the guru came back in spirit form, to tell him what he was up to, what he was doing on the other side. And there's such a beautiful quote there. He talks about his experiences in the astral worlds, and he says, the whole physical universe hangs like the basket on the tree of the astral universe. Meaning as vast as the physical cosmos is, the astral is even more vast. So that starts to give him the idea of how phenomenal, and that's another thing that's it's actually accurate about the geocentric, the physical universe is the smallest, and the other dimensions are gradually bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, containing all the others within them. So even larger than the astral is the interplanetary worlds, which we'll briefly touch upon, and then you get to the heaven worlds. So there are many dimensions from this physical life to even get to the heaven worlds, and there's seven of them, and even that is not the end of the journey, because above that is the kingdom of God, the ultimate, which, by the way, is also where we started from as infants ages ago. So these are not strange, disassociated places. We are part of these right now. There's a there's a beautiful quote in the Quran, not the Quran, I'm sorry, uh, there's a story of Muhammad's night journey to the, to the seven heavens and to the, to the throne of God, and he goes through all these different dimensions, and when he gets to the very top, he says, when I'm there on the throne, all these other dimensions seem small by comparison, meaning the further up you go, the more empowered you become, and the more glorious everything becomes. Now, I want to do draw a little bit from the book. We have some, I have to say, we have some marvelous illustrations that were done by an artist that basically spent his career doing sort of art about the other side. He, he worked with a, a local mystic here in Encinitas. We're in Southern California called Flower Newhouse. She had a, 
a place called Quest Haven. And when we called, when we met with him, we, you know, it was just instant connection. And I love it also because he works in oils. He doesn't even use things like Photoshop. So, you know, the, the oil paintings are hanging in the at the Institute right now. And yes, we gave him the guidelines of what needed to be in the image, but he right away got the sense of how to do it. And we're, we're just so grateful to that. But one of the illustrations is to depict what is it really like in the astral worlds? The astral worlds have everything we have and then some. So, for example, I, we were Barbara was doing a lecture once where she was talking about her experiences on the other side. And she said, well, you know, there's a table and I was, uh, there was this beautiful book and I was, I was asked to sit in this chair and there was a lawyer in the front row and he raised his hand. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me there's tables and chairs on the other side? <laughs> I don't know what image he had of the other side, but it wasn't very a concrete picture, right? He said, you better believe everything here is there. And there are places on the other side that are so much like Earth, you don't even think you've crossed over at first. There are other places which are not. They do have more like this one. This is one of what we would call in the higher astral worlds. And this is where you can do things like float walking. Um, now, in this depiction, this woman is being guided into what we call a healing temple uh, by an angelic being. And she's working on a character flaw. It's not a, phys uh, it's not a spiritual healing like of, of the body, of the astral body. But she noticed uh, in, in, in the story we tell in the book that uh, on Earth, you know, she had a difficult relationship with her father. And it wasn't reconciled. So the father went over without reconciling it. Even she, when it was her time to cross over, didn't reconcile it. This angelic being was trying to help her. He took her to the plane where the father was at, hoping to reconcile even on the other side. And interestingly enough, even there, even then, it didn't go so well. Even then. Remember, you're not an automatic angel just because you've crossed over to the other side. You basically take the things with you there. But that wasn't why she went to the healing temple here. After that experience, she realized something about herself. She realized, you know, I'm not the forgiving type. I realize if someone wrongs me, I can hold a grudge for a very long time. And she's realizing that's the character flaw that she needs to work on. So that's what the angel is helping her with. To get in there, to learn to let go, of, you know, forgive those who trespass on you as you forgive, as forgiveness of when you trespass on others. We are, we are children learning in the great divine playground, and we're going to make mistakes. We're going to step on each other's toes, and sometimes it's going to really hurt. But we have to be forgiving. And that's the example that's happening here in the spiritual worlds. Now, once you do evolve through the various astral planes, and there are seven of them, you could say, gosh, haven't I done it? Aren't I ready for heaven? Well, not quite yet. There's some other beautiful dimensions of life, and uh, some of the Eastern philosophies and theosophies spoke of these realms, like the causal world and places like that, um, these are realms that are actually beyond the astral, but even they are not yet the heaven worlds. And it's in these places that the soul starts to come to terms, not with even a particular incarnation, but with the totality of all their incarnations. Um, it, when we lived in Los Angeles, uh, there was a a church, a Greek Orthodox church, I'm Greek Orthodox, and actually Barbara was too, her father was even a priest, a Greek Orthodox priest, and we went to a church of St. Nectarios, a modern-day saint, very strong healer, and when we went in, we were in the service, she had this vision of him, she saw him, and in the vision, it was, he was asking for forgiveness, have mercy on my soul, and afterwards, I was asking her, why would he need that? I mean, you look at his life and it's exemplary. He says, oh, it's not this life. He was asking forgiveness for past lives. 
So one of the things that has to happen before we can earn the ranks of heaven, we have to work out all of our karma. All of it. Every T must be crossed, every I must be dotted. So it's not only meditation and prayer, it's not only learning, it's working this out. So yes, maybe that difficult situation with a family member or a spouse that's not so pleasant right now, maybe that's karmic. And maybe even though it's not pleasant at the moment, you facing that karma is actually the greatest blessing you could ask for. So one of the things I have learned in this journey is to face your karmic challenges. When things are difficult, don't see them as obstacles. See them as opportunities. We're in school. It's not vacation here. And yes, we can take vacation times when we want. But remember, it's not what's happening in your life that's the measure of your spiritual maturity. It's how you're handling what's happening in your life. That's the measure. And if you notice, God, I got, my buttons were so easily pushed for here. It was, I really got upset. I got angry. I did the, okay, there was a mistake, but try to understand why did I get so upset? Because there's the opportunity to learn and grow and strengthen again that character trait, like that woman realizing she wasn't very forgiving. It wasn't a happy thing to recognize, but actually it was a liberating thing because recognition is half the battle. So once we do reconcile these lives, once we do develop our skills and talents, reach our enlightenment, all these things start to come together in this beautiful maturing of the soul. And then, yeah, then we do get to enter the heaven worlds. Then we do get to be part of, and this first heaven is called spiritual etheria. Um, this is a big painting over at the Institute. He did a very good job with this. The two people in gold robes, those are soulmates, and they're entering heaven together. And these are some of the heavenly souls that are greeting them in this new era of their evolutionary life. So again, one day we will all be citizens of heaven, and it'll be a, a beautiful time in our evolution. Uh, and let's see, that's it. I just want to show that, you know, this is the book that we, we have there. It's available anywhere, you know, you get books. Um, we spent five years writing the book um, because we did try to make it, it could get, it's, these kind of subjects get very dense very quickly. Uh, and we wanted to make it accessible. You know, when uh, Helena Blavatsky wrote The Secret Doctrine, as I understand it, which is considered one of the great classics of all time in metaphysics, the manuscript was handwritten. It, it stood five, five feet tall. And the editor took one look at it. He said, I don't even know where to begin with this. It's basically a first draft, just edited for mistakes. So any of you that do writing, you know, sometimes your first draft is not the cleanest, <laughs> but you're getting all the ideas down on, on paper. And that's what she did so brilliantly. She worked so hard for that, and it really helped the springboard so many things. They say even Albert Einstein kept a copy of it on his desk. Who knows how it may have influenced his, you know, his scientific thinking. All right, I'll step out of this now. Um, and um, Okay. Um, so... I have some questions that I'd like to ask, and then we will open it up for general questions. Um, what are some of the ways that you and Barbara teach in your Kingdom of Light teachings to unfold the spiritual potential needed to awaken divine powers and right. higher consciousness into active expression great great um well one of the most important things is you know first of all everybody's growing even if they don't use the word spiritual or everybody has the potential for growth i mean some are flunking there's there, there are a lot of times but but basically 
but I'm sure most people here, you're here because you've had a spiritual awakening. Something has told you, I need to pursue this more directly. It's not just being a good person, which is very, very important, but no, it's more than that. So this is what Max Heidel would call, you know, sort of the accelerated, the, the, the path of initiation. He described evolution two ways as gentle spiral moving upward, slow but steady, but this straight and narrow, which moved very accelerated, but more difficult. So here, first of all, you want to ask yourself, am I making my spiritual growth my priority? Today, more than ever, our time is getting gobbled up by, you know, time, time, time is everything, right? But if you are saying, I know sometimes people start our classes or want to, and they say, but you know what? I don't know if I have time to meditate. Mm -hmm. And what I say to them is say, well, you don't have time for the divine? Mm -hmm. Make meditation the centerpiece of your day and watch how everything starts to unfold. So the first thing I would, I would recommend is just be Make it a priority. Make it an important thing in your life. And also, don't make it apart from your life. We had a lady ask once, well, you know, my dilemma is I don't know how much time to dedicate to my earth life and how much to dedicate to my spiritual life. Well, you've already divided the house, mm -hmm. right? It's not earth and spiritual. It's all spiritual and all these different facets within it. So are you seeing, are you keeping the house unified now i can also say for myself because i had no metaphysical training i didn't even know what the word was at first right after my even after my awakening i still didn't get it what it was right away um i share from my own experience training i could have read every metaphysical book in the library of congress but without a teacher that's connected there's certain things that just can't happen. You know, the ancient mystery schools in Greece and Egypt and other or the Indian ashrams, the, the guru teacher, the guru student relationship. It wasn't just, oh, I'm going to share you a few things. The, the teacher is literally helping to usher in the soul. Now, Barbara had a teacher too, and another one from the one at 11. Um, and that teacher would say, my job, now she was really connected to the higher, as well as Barbara was, but is, um, she said, oh, my job is to act as an emissary for the higher until the student can build that bridge for themselves. So I would say education is extremely important. And then the other one is what I kind of touched on before. We have to we have to learn from our experiences. I don't think that you can just meditate or sit in a mountaintop and suddenly it's all going to happen. Yeah, great to sit on that mountaintop, but you've got to engage in life too. And when those rough moments happen, see how you can strengthen yourself in those moments. So those are a few keys to kind of get started. Yeah, we we can learn a lot on the other side. But it has to be applied here. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Yeah, and the education continues on the other side for sure. The education absolutely. continues. Yeah. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. But it's not cemented till you do it here. Right. So right. you build up the power. You know what's that old song? If you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. It's not just can... New York. <laughs> not just New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So um, would you talk a little bit about how the other side helps us? Um, you know, spiritism, which I teach, um, talks a lot about our guides and, you know, the help that we get from the other side and how to connect with our guides so that we can benefit more consciously um, from right, their guides. Right. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, because, you know, a lot of people think about the other side as a place when you die, right? Mm -hmm. It's for when your time to cross over. As a matter of fact, there's some people, if they see an angel, they freak out. They think, oh, my God, I'm dying, you know. Well, in the Bible, every time <laughs> an angel appears, the first thing the angel has to say is fear not. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, what we have to realize, which is probably shocking for some that think, especially in a materialistic way, that not, not anyone here, but um, every great idea you have ever had or anyone has ever had that has benefited and uplifted humanity came from the inner worlds. This is the created world. This is the manifested world. And here's where, yes, you have to make it happen here. But the spiritual world is where everything is getting generated. So you're connecting with those worlds right away. And yes, angels and beings, they're all working. You know, we work a lot with divine light. Well, where does the divine light come from? It doesn't come from this light bulb here. It comes from the world of spirit because it's a spiritual light but it's greatly affecting physical life. That's the big key. Mm -hmm. So as what you're really doing in meditation is part of you, you're, you're learning to get in touch with your inner self so you can connect with the inner part of you because the essence of you is not physical. I'm sorry what some say, we're just a bunch of atoms. We're not. Our body is, is like a car. It's a, as Barbara would say, it's a, it's a car like you drive around on this earth, but it, the car is not you. You are the soul, which is not of the physical world at all. Yeah, this is something that um, the how uh, the book talks about the aura. I've always thought of the aura as a manifestation or a reflection of our consciousness. So that if we have a, you know, if we, if, if, if we are um, involved, let's say, in healing work, in healing other people in whatever form, right? It, through compassion and through love, right? Then we're going to have, you know, certain colors in our aura that kind of depict that or reflect that. Um, but in your book, you state that the aura is, and you stated it early in, in your presentation as well, the key to your spiritual ascent it's where you forge your spiritual metal. As you change your aura, you change your life. And that seemed to me almost like putting the cart before the horse. But evidently, that's, you know, because I've always considered, you know, love, meditation, service, compassion to be key. And as we increase our capacity for these, then our spiritual progress is registered or reflected in the aura. I never thought of the aura as fuel, you know, as I always right. saw it as, as a result of our consciousness and, and you know, what, what our life is about. Well, okay, so you bring up a lot of points here. Um, uh -huh. one, thing, one, of the, one of the things, though, that, again, we just said everything starts from the inside out. So... Mm -hmm. One of the things we teach is if it's in your aura, it will show up in your life. And if it's not in your aura, it won't show up in your life until you, you generate that. Okay. Because that's why we meant by change your aura, change your life. Now, maybe a way to illustrate this is because in a way we're, we're say, you're saying similar things, but the aura is definitely more than a reflection of, of where we're at. Yes, it's true. If you see pink around someone indicates they're in a loving state. But the light is consciousness. In yes, other words, yes, what, light what is. is. Yeah. So the divine light has within it the consciousness. So, for example, I mean, wait, let's say I'm uh, I'm very angry right now about something. In my aura, that that's an angry consciousness. I'm even right. with somebody I love. I love you very much, but at this moment, I'm mad at you, and. At that moment, you're not thinking of how much you love them. At that moment, you're thinking how angry you are. At them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then I would see maybe red. In but a vitiated red, a dark, yeah. dirty red. A dark, dirty red. Okay. Not, so, not, a, not enlightened energy. But my right. point here is, okay, I want to get out of that anger. So you can bring in the energy of that deep rose pink, which is love. And that brings the consciousness of love into your aura, which brings you into an awareness of it. And then if you act on that, 
you literally change your consciousness. So you could say change your consciousness, change your life mm -hmm. in that sense, because in that sense, we say consciousness and light walk hand in hand. It's kind of like what comes first, the chicken or the egg, right? <laughs> I mean, if yeah, I... But the, the point is you need to build up that, you know, look, we can hide from each other, right? I could be very upset about something and not show you a single thing. Mm -hmm. but, but if I were seeing your aura, yeah. I would still see it. There. Exactly, exactly, right. exactly. So, so it doesn't have to be... Um, it doesn't have... It, it it would be there even if you weren't physically expressing it, but your consciousness would be there. So right. and in a way you would be expressing it because you're gonna do things that are not so wonderful. Right. right? Yeah. 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 I mean, you're just not saying it out loud, but that you're not gonna be acting wonderful if you're not, you know, who you are is who you are, you know. Right. So right. yeah, and that's why the Bible says they shall be known from the rooftops, because on the other side you you get by the way, you can do some pretty good mind reading this side. So a lot of this camouflaging we do here just doesn't work on the other side. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> There's nowhere to hide. <laughs> yeah, which is great. You know, it's like, okay, uh, you're seeing me with my true colors, but I'm seeing you in your true colors. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Um does your teaching teach that the evolutionary journey um, also that angels and archangels have evolved to that point? Yeah, I yeah. thought so. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so so the different evolutionary kingdoms. So right. you you the the cop uh, the Kabbalistic action says stone becomes a plant, plant an animal, animal a man, a man a god. So yes. That's exactly what spiritism says also, that after, once we evolve out of the human realm, um, we evolve into the angelic realm, you know. Right. Uh, that is a long way from now. We're nowhere near encompass... that point right now. <laughs> What's that? What's We're that? a long ways from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I don't mean even... it's a derogatory. I just mean that that journey I showed you, even through the heaven worlds, we're going to do it as a human being. Yes. Which I actually find, you know, people think, oh, I go to heaven, I'll be an angel. Well, <laughs> it's so hard to get there. I think I want to enjoy it as a human. I'll be angel. <laughs> so that I'll, you know, right. Well, one of the things that, that um, spiritism teaches is that in any given lifetime, we can choose to grow slowly. We can choose to really apply ourselves and grow more quickly we can choose to stagnate and not, you know, just stand still. But we never regress. Oh, and, no, that's not and, true. Well, <laughs> this is a difference between this, this oh, no, uh, no, no, tradition. No, no, no. Look, yeah. if and, you, but, but wait, 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 okay, no, let's mm -hmm. go back to light. Okay? okay. It comes to light. The light is the fuel of your evolution. If you come in at this very high evolutionary level, it means you have built up so much light to sustain you at that level. It's a matter of power. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if I live the life of a tyrant and I use that exalted power to cajole, kill, this, hold on, well, let me finish the thought. Okay. okay. You are losing so much light that you do what we call devolve. Mm -hmm. And you can devolve into the netherworld kingdoms in one life of misuse. It is a fall, for sure, but it's not eternal. It doesn't mean you can't climb back again, but it means you have to rebuild that power. And that is a very long, gradual process. And it's, it's there to also teach the soul a very important lesson. Because we all have to pass this bridge. You know, Barbara shared not, nothing like that happened, but... She was saying in high school, my talents got, I wasn't doing anything, but my talents got so strong, I could, in class, I knew what the teacher was going to ask. I knew the answer to the question before she even asked the question. And yeah, there was a period of time I was getting a little cocky. I was starting to think I was, you know, the cat's meow. 
And one morning she said, I woke up and all my talents were gone. I couldn't see auras. I couldn't pick up people's thoughts. I, I couldn't talk to the higher, none of it. And this went on for about two weeks. And then she thought, have I lost it? Have I, you know, maybe it's, you know, I didn't ask for it to begin with. It just seemed to happen. But then it dawned on her what was really going on. The divine ones were teaching her. Your gifts are not coming from you. Your gifts are coming through you. Mm -hmm. And she said, I never took my talents for granted again after that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people go through a lifetime where they do take it for granted. Mm -hmm. And that's well, a heavy I, karmic burden. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And and I don't um, I don't see uh, faculties such as clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience. I don't see those faculties as necessarily indicative of evolution. Um, on the psychic I, level, that's true. But on the mystic level, it's not true. Uh, well, um, what is the difference between... Oh, it's so um, gigantic. gigantic. Let's, let's, yeah. let's see, let's see what, what that yeah. difference would be if a person is clairvoyant psychically and clairvoyant yeah. mystically, what, what would the, the difference two different be? apparatuses entirely. Okay. Not, one is connected to the psychic. The psychic is like the stepping stone to the spiritual. What we teach, my very first day in class with Barbara, she said, if you came here for psychic development, you've come to the wrong class. Mm -hmm. This is, this is a class in spiritual mystical development. Mm -hmm. Now what happens is, the psychic is like a stepping stone to the spiritual. So again, I'm teaching the teach that I'm offering the teachings here. Mm -hmm. So what happens is if I'm in a very materialistic mind, I'm thinking there's only this physical world, right? That's what the spiritualisms did. They tried to show, they weren't trying to show there was God. They were trying to show there was a spirit life. Mm -hmm. They was trying to show there was life beyond the physical veil. Mm -hmm. So psychic does that. It mm -hmm. takes you out of the physical. So, for example, a medium is using psychic tools to pick up things from the other side. And they're using the psychic mechanism. Of, yeah, it's a question of semantics also because uh, Spiritism teaches there's a difference between psychic and medium. A psychic is basically reading thought forms and a medium is connecting with spirit. But it's a psychic mechanism. Yeah. But that's completely different than the mystical mechanism. They're two right. completely Oh, I totally agree. Right. Yeah. But the problem with the psychic is it's not nearly as powerful as the mystical. Absolutely. Absolutely. It can be misleading, mm -hmm. which is why we tell that story of the transmedium in the book. Mm -hmm. it was, I don't know if any of you know transmediumship, but the idea is you go into a trance state someone a spirit comes in and talks through you right and it can be kind of mesmerizing you know like you you feel mm -hmm. like you're literally talking to the spirit well in this but the problem is you and the audience don't know who's really talking you just know what's actually being said mm -hmm. and in this one story that barbara shares she had a friend that was fascinated by this she went to this one event and it was a a, a trance they don't do so much of it now i think as they did years ago I was he was popular and he, I guess he was a handsome guy and you know he had a certain amount of charisma and he went into trance and supposedly this you know 20 20,000 year old guru ca came through him and he could tell what was happening in the audience he was interacting and they were really enjoying it but Barbara wanted to use her mystical skills to find out who is the actual control I want to see who the actual spirit is right she has a technique of how to do that it's a very dramatic story. She said, when I shined the light and I was sitting in the way back of the room, my friend had no idea what I was doing. I saw the control, but it wasn't this elevated spirit. It was a it lower was spirit. Totally spirit right? It was impersonal, right? Now, yeah. after a while of her doing this, it was aware, it became aware of what she was doing. Mm -hmm. And in full trance, this is, I will never forget this story. <laughs> This guy gets up in trance, the spirit's making him do it. The audience has no idea what's going on, walks all the way across the, the, on the hall, leans over to Barbara and says in a quiet voice, withdraw your light. What do you expect coming from a drunkard like this? 
Yes. And then she left. <laughs> and I would say that the medium in that case, the trans medium, was probably not very highly evolved no. to attract that or level of spirit because a medium who is highly evolved would attract a higher spirit with something really useful to say. Well, there are good psychics and mediums, but again, it's limited. There's a cap on it because it's not the mystical. It's not the mystical. So right. what you're getting here, why Barbara is the Mozart metaphysics, is it's it's the mystical connection. Mm -hmm. The reason yeah. I want to emphasize it here is you want to make sure, if any of you are having psychic experiences, do bless it. It's part of your apparatus, but don't lean on it for your spiritual evolution. Right. Take right. it, you know, people come into the classes, they say, oh, I saw this light, I saw that. How do I? They want these deep interpretations, and we say, that's God knocking, tapping on your shoulders, saying, good job, but right. keep focused on your mystical journey. It's a slower road, but when those skills open up, that is meaning a sign at that point. It can only happen after you have, you know, Bavasky talked about this herself, where she said, before you got anywhere near those levels, you had to purify your soul. You know, there's a lot of work you had to do to be ready for that. Yeah. 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 It's... Um... Uh, this is the problem, one of the problems of the New Age movement. Right, is, which is kind of past now, I understand. <laughs> it's well, not the old age That now. would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, is that, uh, that, that desire to uh, develop the faculties without the foundation. And, you know, one of the things that spiritism emphasizes is the importance of having a foundation in good works and um, inner work and um, study and understanding uh, and meditation and prayer uh, and not putting not putting the faculties, not making the faculties the, uh, you know, the important thing to acquire because the ego can be very involved in that. Well, and you will be tested, you know. Choice. Again, clair at least mystic clairvoyance is a byproduct of your evolution. It, it, it will happen and at the right time when you're ready for it. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. It, that Again, I'm giving you the kingdom of light teachings, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, words, the psychic can open early, but not the mystical, not before you're ready. Right. Yeah. Um, and even then you yes, can... Yes, I would agree with that. The mystical will not, but the psychic can. Yeah, so, but that's yeah. the risk. That's why we're yeah. saying psychic is a mixed bag. Yeah. The mystical is not. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. I yeah. agree. Yeah. I agree with that. Um, so if, today, the world is in crisis on so many levels, climate, war, a lot of others. How, how, do, you, how do you apply the metaphysics that you teach to our approach to these issues? Well, that's a great question. Uh, you know, we did a, a series of lectures for a while called The Compassionate Earth. And one of the things you try to do, you know, I remember years ago, I was watching a special, and they were talking about millions of people in North Korea with hunger problems, right? And I remember asking Barbara, well, how does, how does the divine, how does God see all this problem, you know, all these starving children? And, and right away, the hire came in. God doesn't see them as starving children. Mm -hmm. God sees them first as his precious children. Mm -hmm. We've got to be careful that we're not confusing experiences that we're going through as a, as a society with what's really going on underneath. In other words, uh, compassion, let's say a, a, my, a loved one is acting very bad or mean or whatever, and I can say, oh, you're, being, you're a bad person, you know? Well, that's not what's going on. They're a good person, but they're doing bad things. Mm -hmm. So same with civilization. We're, we're a collection of immortal souls. So when we're all, as a civilization, inherently good. 
even when we're doing collectively things that are not so good. Now, there's an interesting, uh, some have done actually statistics with this, comparing the world 150 years ago to today's civilization. We are far better off as a civilization than we were 150 years ago on multiple levels. The, 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 the seismic improvement is remarkable, but yet, as you're saying, we often feel more anxious now about things than we did 150 years ago. So what's going on here? If, if things are, and again, there are problems in the world, what's going on? And it has to do with perception. It has to do with what we're picking up from others. For example, multiple times we've, we've, the inspirations come in. The world is not getting worse. The world is getting better. Yeah, you depends, want to be careful. Depends who you read. Steven Pinker says it's getting better. Yeah, but um, I'm saying the divine is saying this. Uh huh. We're heading yeah, into. A, I think. A I think in some ways it is getting better, but I think there's also still a lot of, um, you know, a, a lot of injustice and a lot of um, yes. polarization and a lot of corruption. But those are not going to stay around. Yeah, that's but the point. Are the, you the saying then that we should not? take any kind of action we no, should no 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 what i'm saying is don't accept the gloom and doom scenarios that's what i'm saying because gloom and doom i just read this morning a sad story this teenager right started absorbing all these gloom and doom things and this that and the other and there is no god and it's just all atoms and uh, he committed suicide yeah well that's that happens a lot these days no, but that happens because we're accepting things that but, aren't necessarily yeah. the truth but you, especially at that age you don't have the tools of critical thinking to be able to discern what's true and not what you want to make sure is there's a purpose for every single person on this earth you are I meant agree. to contribute to society and don't let anyone discourage you from what you need to do or you think well what's the point you know the the joke that Woody Allen gave years ago when he was a little kid he wouldn't do his homework you know and the the teacher was there with the mother and said well, why aren't you doing your homework well the universe is expanding what's the point <laughs> and he and she, the mother said well it's not expanding in Brooklyn you know <laughs> <laughs> you know we can let things get to us but what that ends up having is having a bit of a paral paralyzing effect. Okay, and that that there is there is a difference between. Here's how I see it. Um, I think there are a lot of problems in the world, and some of them we can maybe do something about, and others we can't. Um, I mean, individually, think, individually. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, I think that um, we need to have our eyes open and, and see the injustice or the racism or whatever is going on that needs to be redeemed, needs to be rectified, of course. Um, but without going into fear and without going into anger, realizing, recognizing that this person who is perpetrating some heinous act right. um, is also a divine spark exactly in exactly. essence i yes um but you know i see two things that happen one is that a lot of people who are spiritually oriented uh they they you know it's like they want to have blinders on and they don't want to watch the news or whatever or know anything about the negative things going on because you know it'll 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 distract them from their spiritual work and i think that there on the other side there are a lot of activists who uh who who do you know they 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 want to make things better but they're coming from anger they're coming from fear they're coming from frustration and that energy just makes it worse Okay, so I think we what we need is a spiritually informed 
activism. I don't think it's enough to just, you know, not do anything. And and, well, and you're you're a member of you know you're a member of society, right? The Athenian oath talked about getting involved in society. So all of us do need to do our civic duty. You know, I think to here, at least in the United States, I don't know where everybody is calling from, but to find even in a good year maybe 50 or 60 percent of the voting population actually votes yeah is a scary thing considering how many people died for that freedom to vote but it's because people think again there's that discouragement my vote yes. won't make a difference so my only point just to answer your the question that you're asking is there's always there's going to be again earth is a school it's in a process of developing itself so what you want to do is keep a clear head, you know, the seven liberal arts, what was it trying to teach, how to think critically, how to think objectively. When you're getting information, you don't just accept it blindly, you have to process it a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you have to get a perspective and not just say, oh, you believe it, so I'll believe it. Mm -hmm. And then you'll handle this, you know, you'll be able to get through this, but you want to make sure, yes, of course, you're for, if you can, you know, actually, it's a karmic thing, if, if somebody is drowning, and you know how to swim and you don't help them, you say, oh, it's a karma to drown. Well, actually, you're creating karma, you know, because yeah. you could have done something about it. Exactly. So absolutely, you should get involved in your in, in the affairs, especially when you see you can make a difference. And if it's something you can't, then your prayers, your prayers mm -hmm. count for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, okay. thank you. I, I like that answer. <laughs> oh, it's, it's I, I think it's important. <laughs> Um, uh, so let's see, let's open it up now, uh, to the members of our audience. Okay. So does anyone, would anyone like to ask a question or make a comment? Rose. Um, I, I am very new to the subject of reincarnation and okay. spirits and guides. I'm really new to it. And I've read about a hundred and maybe thirty pages of your book. Oh my goodness! Yeah, and I can't put it down. I really find it very fascinating. Great, but you talk you. about the astral level, and I think I'm up to level five. Right. And I wonder if you have a book that um, explains, like an introduction, an introductory uh, view of astral. I, from what you said tonight. And what I've read in the book, I I thought it was after you die, you go to the astral plane. But you what do. you're saying, you do. You but do. don't you come back? And you, I mean, you. It sounded like I don't. I. It's not clear to well, me. So well, okay, no, 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 Rosa, it's a great question. So, um, so let's say um, you do cross over to the fifth astral plane, okay? And as you know, there's different dimensions within that astral. The sub, that fifth plane, let's say you have a wonderful life over there, you do all the things you're meant to accomplish, and then you'll most likely reincarnate from that same astral plane back on the earth again. But you'll be kind of newly empowered with the knowledge you had from the previous life and the experiences, and then whatever you did on that side for another lap to kind of develop. And then slowly, you're kind of graduating through those subplanes You'll reach the place where you finish with the fifth astral, and then you move to the sixth astral. And then you'll start that, re you'll keep that reincarnation process going. But now you're going to be at a, you'll have more power again. You'll be at a higher, a higher level of development. So no, you are reincarnating through these different dimensions. But the, the point that, that Gloria was mentioning before, you're also receiving from them while you're here in physical life. So you're you're being blessed by the higher powers through the spiritual dimensions to, to help you along the road here. Whatever, let's say you're whatever level you're at right now, uh, Rose, that you're vibrating at that right now. So you're already kind of there's already a correspondence, even though you're you're in your physical body right now. Okay. So is there one of your books that you would recommend for a more in-depth appreciation of what you're saying? Well, I mean, the only, the only book that came to mind is the book we do on the angels, which goes into the support mechanism. But this is the book 
you know, I mean, we have a course on this, but this is the book that goes into actually what the dimensions are. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate your teaching. May I ask you a yeah. question. So if you're new, what yeah. got you interested in metaphysics to begin with? What, what uh, opened the door for you? Well, <laughs> I took the Course in Miracles with Gloria and, ah. as a facilitator and other people that I've met in those classes um, seem to have a vast knowledge, much more than I, about reincarnation. And so it's piqued my interest. I, I never really gave any serious consideration to after okay. I die, anything. Yeah. And so, course, I'm, like, I'm an eager doesn't, student. <laughs> the Course in Miracles doesn't teach reincarnation either, right? No, 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 it doesn't. But the people that I met through that. The people that, that, that were in there. Yeah. Were in yeah. there. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But thank right. you. What really happened is something stirred in you. Yeah. Something yeah. said. Yeah. Some of the discussion yeah. probably uh, referenced reincarnation, and so now Rose is taking the Spiritism 101 class, which is based very much in reincarnation. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's um, a question in the chat from Megumi Yamada. Uh, you know Megumi very well. <laughs> okay. It says, in the illustration of entering heaven, what do the lights above people's heads represent? They seem to be different colors. Well, not only different colors, they're different shapes. So in other words, as each of us, as we reach those mature states, not only are we reaching into a beautiful level, but we're making our own unique mark. You know, uh, one of the things that's so beautiful that Barbara brought in was, you know, an inspiration from the higher is, if one soul were missing, creation would not be complete. Hmm. So we're all playing an important part. And when you get to those very mature levels, it will continue. So your mark is going to be, you know, again, we're not machines, right? We're not robots. We're trying to be more expressive. And that was kind of a, a simple way to try it. Not simple, but there are marks in each of our auras at that level that don't in, in, denote part of our uniqueness of whatever it is we're contributing and rose for example going back to reincarnation yes you will do many things in your different reincarnated lives many different jobs many different this that but once you look back on all of it you will notice there's certain through lines you know let's say the great soul of mozart i'm sure he had lifetimes where he was maybe a baker you know <laughs> you know but Clearly, one of his through lines was this miracle he does with music. So all of us will have that. And you also learn that when, you know, with the angels, they even have their specialties, right? They're angels of healing, angels of love. Doesn't mean an angel of love doesn't know how to heal, but there's this embodiment. Uh, Barbara shared a story once. She was doing an aura lecture years ago, and the higher brought in this really advanced soul, this human soul, and she goes... She was telepathically communicating with him. So, well, why, why is he here? He doesn't need to be at this lecture. Well, he's got an advantage, but he doesn't know that much about the aura. He, in other words, they wanted to bring him in. Even he had certain things to learn, even though he had climbed quite high. Yeah, yeah and I think we, we develop different talents in different lifetimes. Yeah. For instance, um, someone like Mozart would not need another lifetime of music. He would probably choose maybe science or art or something else to uh, start to um, develop, uh, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. Any other and questions? Then, any more questions? Pat? I always ask questions. Someone, someone is, yeah, there you go. I saw like going like this. <laughs> I always have questions, but actually I have a comment on what Gloria just said about different lifetimes and Mozart probably wouldn't come back as a, a composer or musician. I think sometimes we have the ability or we get glimpses of what our past lives have been when we have interests. Like I love doing um arts and craftsy things and stuff like that but i'm terrible at it in this lifetime so i may have been an artist in the last time i may have been a musician in a past life yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. 
but the, the interesting thing is, oh, you got a little pal back there. Well, <laughs> they're all over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we lost it. Okay. Um, yeah, again, we, we're not meant to accomplish all of it in one single lifetime. So again, let's say take the Mozart. He may, he may be weak. You know, he wasn't a very good businessman, you know. Um, and so he may, they may hold back some of that talent so he could develop another part of his nature and yes, if you have a real fondness for something, but maybe this lifetime it isn't as fully fleshed out, exactly right. You may have really done it before, but this time that the, the love is there, but you're meant to kind of pursue other things. Yeah, I have other lessons to learn. Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. when you were talking it's about- It's not the- lost. It's not lost. So in the end, that will all come back to you. Right. Um, yeah. And then I have, I have a question, if I can remember what it was. Um, about the auras um what do you think about aura photography do you find that it is um in a way (laughs) you do have a few animals Uh, though yeah i've got three cats and a dog and this cat drives me crazy um wants attention yeah so um do you find that it that aura photography actually shows a person's true aura I can't see somebody's arm. Oh, like look, talking about um, when you see it. But... Uh, I, I have a, a couple, co- and here I'm not, I'm not judging, but I can share with you things that, because when the when our first book came out, every aura company wanted Barbara's endorsement, right? And the minute we asked for a little bit of the science, they ran the other way. What is an aura company? Can, can, they make those aura cameras. No. Oh, like curly and photography? Well, no, no, no. Curly no. photography is different. So, okay. so curly now, curly photography was absolutely fascinating. So, one that was very different from these cameras that are out there now. That's oh, not, I, guess I don't know anything about those. Yeah, yeah. Curly photography was in the 1960s, mm-hmm. and one of the real fascinating things with curly photography was, okay, they would take like a leaf, right, and yeah. they put it on a plate. They'd run an electrical current through it, and then it, you would see these flares, right, okay. around it, and that was what they thought was an aura. Now, mm-hmm. in some cases, it didn't happen 100% of the time. They would take that leaf, they would cut it in half, put the half of it on the plate, run the current through it, and you would see the full. The outline. Of, outline. Even like the, the phantom the, leaf. The phantom because, leaf, Yeah. yeah. So there was clearly something saying there that while it wasn't trying to photograph an aura, but it was showing there must have been some other effect going on if the electrical charge was still picking up the full thing, even though it was out. That was fascinating. I wish they would keep up with that. Mm -hmm. But these modern ones are completely different. What it is, is I finally caught up with one of the leader guys and he confessed it's just a spectrometer. It's not an aura camera. So then why would I have, I've had at least three photos. I, I'm kind of, um, I get involved with the spiritual holistic shows and stuff like that. And, yeah. um, and so I've had at least three taken. And each time I've actually been, it, 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 the first one I ever had was green, which basically means I'm a healer, which I sort of am. And um, then it went to a, a bluish and a purplish color. And the last one I had was white with purple up at the crown chakra. So I, I, I don't know. I feel like my spirituality and my gifts are increasing. And I don't know if that's what's showing with these photos. Well, all I can tell you is it's not photographing the aura. Okay. It doesn't mean it's not picking up anything. What they're doing is they're, they're taking a spectrometer. They're, they're reading certain signs in your body, Right. And they've programmed it to look like an aura around you. Now, yeah, if you're very angry, you know, it's like if you had a mood ring, you got really changed, it would change colors, right? So yeah, if you are in a different state of mind, it will pick up certain things, but that doesn't really make it an aura. It it makes it that it's picking up things going on. Okay, so it's picking up the actual energy. I don't don't care what- Physical energy, the physical energy. You remember, you, you are- People don't realize our body's electrically charged, right? They right, don't, right. They forget that part. There is an electrical charge in the body, and it is affected by things going on with us, and th- that charge can be picked up. 
Okay. You know? So you put your hand on the device or whatever it is. It's, it's picking up an electrical charge in you. Okay. And they've, they've trained it. Now, it's just a coin phrase to call it an aura camera. Right. And again, I would nothing would be make us happier than a camera that could really look. They are they are splitting atoms into tiny little fractions, right? If there really was a physical machine that could pick up an actual auric field, believe me, we would be the happiest people on earth and science would be all over this. So it it it's just I wish it were I wish it were so is all I could say. But practically we've never seen anything that actually shows that. The closest was that curly in photography. Yeah, I've heard about again, that. Again, I don't know why they shut that down. They stopped that research, or it went secret, one or the other. Yeah. That <laughs> well, was, it was in really Russia, stuff. wasn't it? Didn't yeah, it? Yeah, it was in Russia. Russia? Yeah, they, exactly. Mm. But there was some real genuine stuff going on yeah. there, and I just wish they had continued it. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't. I don't know what happened there. Yeah, there was some real mm. interesting, you know, a lot of interesting studies sometimes get stifled or get turned and lose their funding. Yeah, I know. It's like, uh oh, you're starting to discover things. I don't know if we want you to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that happens too. Any um, other questions? Yeah, any other questions? I have a question. Okay. Um, how would you say the manner of a person's death? affects the person's transition to the other side not where they end up because that has to do right, with right, right, right. evolution but um wow that's a great question um well there's two parts to that question the actual dying itself and the state of mind we're in when we pass on mm -hmm. um i just can't imagine now at this point in my life what it would be like to think there is nothing there. I'm just going into a blank void. It's all over after this. I can't imagine the psychological depression that would be creating if you were that close to that point and you knew you were dying and you thought there was just nothing. Um, I think, I think a lot of people what, what find happens. their God, for people find their faith on their deathbed, right? <laughs> right, well, that too. But I think that um, sometimes when someone is convinced that there is nothing after death, um, after they pass, they don't realize they've passed because well, I'm still happen. here. So how yeah. can I be dead? I'm not dead. So, so I must be still alive and they can't understand yeah. why people can't hear them and don't talk to them and... You know, well, those are earthbound spirits. Yeah. So two things can happen. That can happen. You, you can make the crossover and this is, you know, um, and not realize you've died. You're on the other side and you say, what do you mean? I, I see you, Gloria, you see me. I'm not dead. And then when they realize they're not where they think they are, they freak out. Mm -hmm. But these other cases do happen. That's that's very unfortunately true where, mm -hmm. you know, that happened. I had that experience when I lived in the previous home. From where I am now, uh, uh, when we bought it, it was a probate house, is meaning that the people, you know, it owned it died, and the house went into probate. Um, well, the gentleman died in the house. He died of Agent Orange, you know, from the Vietnam War era, mm -hmm. and this was going to be where he was going to build his family, and he had a new wife, and you know, here all these hopes and dreams, and here I guess he literally died in the house. I moved in shortly after. And um, Barbara was telling me, you know, make sure you purify the house. <laughs> but I didn't have time to do that. I didn't sink in or whatever. And I remember the first night, all the boxes were still in the living room. I was sleeping on the living room floor. And I wake up at dawn. And I see these two hands trying to strangle me. Ah, goodness. And, I mean, it's serious. He's really doing something, you know. And I'm thinking, this is one crazy dream. But I'm awake. This is not a dream, right? And but I also know it wasn't a physical person either. It wasn't, you know. So I, I'm again, you know, I'm in this kind of other state myself. Finally, I shake this loose, whatever it is. And then I later I ask Barbara, "What the heck was that?" And she says, "It's him. He's mm. still there, like you said, Gloria. He didn't know he died, and he thinks you're an intruder, 
He's trying mm-hmm. to protect his house. And even with her help, who can communicate with him, it mm-hmm. still took about three days to convince him he's really got to leave and go to the other side. So, mm-hmm. yeah, they say at funerals, you know, often the loved ones will be there, the deceased. But you always say, follow the angels home. I'm fine. Follow the angels home. You know, you, you don't want... They've got another life to go to, you know, and no love is ever lost. You're going to reunite with them anyway. But, you know, when they see people, loved ones, see loved ones here grieving excessively, it makes them sad. And sometimes it makes them come around maybe more than they should. So, yes, have the grief. Yeah, exactly. Guilty. So they can't go on. Yeah. Yeah, No, but but in terms of the manner of death, let's get back to that. Uh, So. You mean like whether I fell off a cliff or I was burned in a... Yeah, like if it's a violent death, either through natural means, you know, like an earthquake or a fall or something, or or through violence, you know, from another person killing you. Um, how how would you say? And I think it it I think it has a, it still has a lot to do with how much you understand about yeah. the process, yeah. right? Um, but still, it's kind of a shock uh, to the spirit, I would think. You know, we had uh, Jim Tucker, who does research on children who remember previous lives. Mm-hmm. And, awesome. he, and he told me that um, about 75%, at least 75% of these children who remember previous lives in detail, right? In enough detail that they investigate, that they feel they can investigate using police records and hospital records and different things and, and interviewing um, uh, people that the child identifies by name, you know, who was there. So about 75 or more percent of these children died violently. And I think the tendency um, to remain earthbound is greater when you die violently if you're not a very evolved soul right and incarnate very quickly as well well that's an interesting statistic because um i i remember reading somewhere right after world war ii you know of course a lot of people died there and um children were getting born and they were like sort of like still in some of those concentrated they were having it somehow mem- you know haunting yeah. memories or not yeah. mem- haunting nightmares of being in like a concentration yeah area, you know yeah and, um, and i think and, that's because they reincarnate so quickly yeah like the memory is still so fresh they haven't had time to process time. yes right now what exactly so what what our understanding is there is if it was your karma to die young, sometimes, you know, oh, yeah. you're meant to die as a child, right? Mm-hmm. And you don't reincarnate quickly, then you'll stay right. on the other side and grow up. But like you're saying, if it was an untimely death, especially whatever it was, then you're absolutely right. You reincarnate very quickly because you didn't really have time to finish what you started. And mm-hmm. interesting, I guess what this gentleman was finding out was that they tend to have a stronger sense of that memory. Yeah of us going and unfortunately it's a little traumatic because they're they're remembering that but hopefully they get beyond that and they finish you know they get on the they're they 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 are given another opportunity to finish what what they what they had yeah start. and and i think the benefit of the work that he does is that the child realizes that was a separate life and this is a separate life and they have to focus on this life now you know well, it's it's very interesting too with children. Um, if you like, I'm well, I won't give names here, but someone I knew that was a, a child, and she was having all these spiritual experiences, seeing things. Oh my God, it was almost like an open door. It wasn't supported in the family environment, right? Mm-hmm. You know, a couple of years ago, I was talking to her, she's a grown woman now, saying, uh, do you remember all this stuff? She doesn't remember any of it. Yeah, usually not even not, not even not only it's not happening to her, she's not yeah. even remembering it. Yeah. So when you're young, yeah, you are a little bit like an open door. Mm-hmm. And if it's encouraged in the right way, 
that door can stay open. But I thought, gosh, it's sad. You had such an interesting, you know, natural things you were seeing. And now you don't even, it's not even in your mm -hmm. register of it right well, now. Well, usually by the time there's seven or eight, the memory yeah, exactly. is exactly. gone. Yeah. Which is interesting too, because at seven, the aura starts to become set. Mm -hmm. So up to that point, it's a very open door because as you know, we're, we have to absorb. If you, I, I, there, that's a whole interesting study to how do you support young children in their spiritual development, but without forcing things on them, um, but giving them a foundation so that as they get older, you know, these experiences they may have had become an asset rather yeah. than something that well happen. supporting them you know if the parents are aware like yep. my my daughter when she was four years old i was oh. tucking her into bed one day and uh she said mommy god is love no oh, and i said so yes <laughs> that's right god is love and but I knew I hadn't said that to her in those words, right? Right, right? And I said, Where where did you hear that? And she said, In school. Well, she was in a nursery school once a week, but it wasn't any kind of spiritual school. So I said, They taught you that in nursery school? And she said, Oh, not nursery school. So oh. I said, what, the, what kind of school are you talking about? And she said, it's a special school and it's in my heart. And when I go to sleep, I go there and God tells me things. Oh my God. Yeah. That's so kind. It's so sweet. Right. Well, look, so. she had you created, and I'm sure you, you know, an environment to let that thrive. You're opening up, of course, and uh, could be a whole other talk about how sometimes we visit the world of spirit during our sleep time. Yes, yes. I love that section in your book because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. very similar to what yeah. we learn in school. Uh, now is she grown? How, where, what is she doing now? <laughs> <laughs> um, she does events that are um, designed to elevate people's consciousness. Also, oh, not, not specifically just spiritually, but, you know, artistically and, oh, you know, other ways. Does she have a... Does she have a strong faith in God? Is that like? Um, I think she does. Yes, but uh, she is not overtly. Uh, you know, I think she's still kind of searching for her own spiritual path. Well, she'll know? find it. She'll find it. Oh yeah, yeah. But yeah. she has an inherent understanding. You know, sensitivity really? to a lot of things. And she's yeah, very intuitive. To remember those things. Yeah, we're kind of. A book at that age is kind of it's kind of beautiful actually yeah 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 it is all well, right anybody uh, else yeah anybody else have a question <laughs> there's such a lot of information in this book i can't one thing that i thought was interesting was it said that um in the lower I guess the lower astral realms, there are buses and trains and planes and things like that to get people from one place to another. And that it's only in the, I don't remember exactly which realm, which level that you learn to just float walk. And right, I, but, yeah. I didn't, yeah, I always thought once you're in the spirit world, you don't walk like a human anymore. You can just kind of float around, but maybe not. No, well, the so the 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 astral plane, so the seven astral planes, and the ones that kind of interpenetrate Earth vibration are three and four. So mm -hmm. a lot, the most souls on Earth right now are actually somewhere on the fourth astral plane. And when we talk about the spiritual awakening that's happening, many of you are getting ready to jump to the fifth. So it's the fifth plane that you can start to do these things that really have no correlation on physical life. But it's not like a hustling, bustling city. You know, there, there, there are locomotion and yeah, train is possible. But it's not like you're stuck in traffic. And think mm -hmm. life there is a little bit more, shall we say, provincial, because you you can. And then again, holy ones, you know, angels can still take you, and they have their mm -hmm. own ways of moving things around. So that can happen too. But. Yeah, if you visit the fourth astral plane, you would feel very much like you were on Earth. But if you were on the fifth, you would definitely say, I'm not on Earth. It feels Earth-like, but 
I wish I could do this on earth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. I thought, why would they need trains? And Well, again, everything here was created there. And there's even a type of TVs over there. And as I understand, Barbie used to say years ago, they've got 3D. They've got, you know, they've got the holographic things mm. over there so but mm -hmm. again because of telepathy and other natural it's not nearly you know we become so we're still i think fascinated with our gadgets right now but mm -hmm. if right now humanity could do all the things we do on the other side we would not be so fascinated with our iphones and we would be there'd be other things that would grab our attention but we would still have these tools for when we need them but now we're kind of mesmerized by them you know mm -hmm. yeah I heard a strange thing that there are there are kids now developing almost like a hump, a, a bump or something from all this texting uh -huh. that you know <laughs> it's wow. actually showing up. There's a physiological reaction mm -hmm. to this hours of texting, you know, that's going yeah. on right now. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if that has an effect on the etheric body. Oh, or... it's gonna be a little beating. The the and it's it's a compulsive. There was a, a story of a 13-year-old girl. She was texting 200 times a day, and her mother wanted to punish her, so she took her phone away. The girl got violent to the point they had to call the police. Just yeah, like a drug, right? It's yeah, an addiction. Like yeah. 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 That's so sad. Yeah. That's really sad. All right. Well, let's well, thank see. you very much. I I have the aura book, but I don't see auras and it's all about meditating. And I'm still kind of, um, I know I should meditate, but I'm too busy. So <laughs> I, I, I'm working on that, but I, I'm i going to go and order this other book right away. It sounds okay. like I might be able to. Yeah, well, the, to you know, even leave a little bit of time. You know, they the, the Dalai Lama uh, years ago, he asked the science community to research his lamas you know his, mm -hmm. uh, the meditation and do, have you read those those yes yeah, yeah. yeah so you know there's literally a positive physiological effect on the brain by by meditating you know yeah it, it's it's funny when we were writing that book you know barbara had those volumes of knowledge on the aura and i thought well what do you leave in what do you leave out but as we were writing we began to realize it's not actually an aura book it's a meditation book on mm -hmm. the aura and then everything started the fall into place yeah, yeah yeah it is again we would encourage you to even just try a little bit for a week some of the meditations oh, just no i i have i have been doing that i'm i was teaching a couple of classes at our you know senior community senior fun stuff mm -hmm. and um, and that's over and it's like i am okay i'm going to simplify my life i'm going to <laughs> stop you know and but I, it feels so weird, you know, because, I mean, I've been for 68 years, it's like, you know, you got to be doing something constructive and the slowing down business, that just <laughs> yeah. doesn't feel right, you know, it's like, that's just un-American. Well, <laughs> think of meditation as being constructive. <laughs> yeah. And productive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, my husband is supportive. I mean, I'm very blessed to, I mean, he's already doing it. So he's a very wow. good example for me. Oh, good. So. Oh, good. Well, good. great. I'm sure you'll get around and hopefully you'll enjoy the other book as well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Meditating um, is very tough though. When you, when your brain is ADHD, ADD, I, yep, yep. I, yeah, I'm all over the place. I can't, I I've tried so hard and it's like, I give. Tai Chi, Tai Chi was really helpful for me because it's moving. Mm. So it's a moving meditation, but I had to drop out of my school. I can do it on my own now, but, mm -hmm. but then it becomes meditative when I don't have to worry about, oh, you're doing this move last year's way. You know, we've changed it now, you know. <laughs> but you're also disciplining your mind, right? So yeah. that's part of the, if you think of your mind like a muscle, um, I think part of the reason I learned to meditate quickly is I used to play a lot of classical piano and you're, you are sitting in one place for hours, right? Focusing on the music. Mm -hmm. 
and that's a discipline to be able to sit down and do that. Well, you can take that and reapply it in another. So if you're finding discipline in one, one form, you can take that skill and apply it to another. One of the things I do like about the meditations we do is they aren't their meditative prayers. So you are verbalizing. Mm -hmm. And when you're doing that, it does help to focus the mind. And you're also visualizing a color. So that also helps to focus the mind. So you're not just, you know, you're you're actually, you are engaged in something, but it's just not physically moving around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you might, you know, you're, and your book even mentions about how at a certain stage of the spiritual journey, um, it's good to have a teacher. So I think that meditation is a good reason to have a teacher, um, you know, just even if it's just taking a course in meditation, you know, from from a, from someone who teaches it and is um, and and a, the book also mentions about how, you know, you have to discern between a good teacher and a not so good teacher who might have their own agenda, right? Um, right. And that made me think of um, uh, a very good teacher who, whom I uh, I used to attend her satsang sometimes. I I had a teacher, of, I had a spiritual teacher in my twenties, early twenties, uh, who was amazing and very excellent. Um, but later, I I uh, came across a woman named Gangaji. I don't know if you're familiar with her, but she's she's a, a very good spiritual teacher. And somebody asked her one time in in the satsang, how, you know, how can you tell the difference between a, a a true teacher, you know, or a good teacher, or a bad teacher who, you know, has an ego and is doing it for the wrong reasons? And she said. I think the important thing is to be a good student, because if you're a good student, even a bad teacher can't can't hold you back. And I thought that was an excellent. Um, I mean, you still want to find a good teacher, but I thought that was an excellent perspective on uh, because you attract the teacher that you're ready for. So if you focus on being a true student, then you'll attract right. the true that student. That old expression, when the, te when the student's ready, the teacher appears. Exactly. And yeah. say that was certainly true in my own life. And, yeah, uh, me too. <laughs> uh, yeah, so it, it uh, and you know, another thing we say, the thing, put, put the principles to the test. Mm -hmm. Don't accept something blindly. When people do fall prey to false prophets, often... They're, they're letting other people sort of do the thinking for them, you know. So try them out, you know, try out the principle. Okay, here's what's being taught. Well, try it out. And if it works for you, that's kind of a validation that it, it's 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 working for you. Mm -hmm. Looks like we lost somebody. Whoops. Oh, there you are. You're still there. Somebody left, but Ginny's yeah. still there. All, right. All, All right. right. Well, anything, did you have any other question about that, Ginny? No, no, I just really enjoyed the talk. So thank you. Good, good. Thank you. All right. All I did right. too. Thank you very much, Dimitri. Thank you. It was a pleasure and, uh, being here. Thank you. Highly recommend much. his their book. Um and uh thank you all for attending and we'll see you next time.